All right, we are recording right now, and I'm about to start the store of uh, Nevsky Prospect. I do want to mention that in case we get disconnected, just please stay on the line for 10 minutes. Most likely I'll be back. I did have a connectivity issue yesterday. I hope it doesn't happen again today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, give you a panoramic view of St. Petersburg just to give you an overview where our main street is located and um at any point during our tour today please feel free to ask any questions you're welcome to unmute yourself and just jump in or you can put the questions in the chat um, either way uh, i love to answer questions and this is downtown st petersburg right in front of you at the heart of our city is our main river, which is called the Neva River, right here. And um, if we are talking about the actual downtown, at the heart of the downtown is our main street, Nevsky Prospect. So here it is. Nevsky Prospect is pretty long. It is four kilometers long. Um, so it's all the way down there. And we will see some of the most famous sites of Nevsky Prospect. Um, it starts uh, almost by the river, starts with uh, our royal residence uh, and connects to the main square of our city right here. Uh, the main square is called uh, the Palace Square. And basically this is what we're going to do today. We're going to use our imagination and pretend that we're actually walking down Nevsky Prospect. So we will start in the beginning and the last site that we will see will be at the end. And uh, so the beginning of Nevsky Prospect is connected with our beautiful main square, the Palace Square. At the center of the Palace Square, there is this column right here. Uh, the column is called Alexander's Column. And Alexander, you know, is one of the most popular Russian names, probably. So which Alexander was it? So the Alexander, in whose honor the column is named, is Alexander I. Alexander I, he was the ruler of Russia, the Russian Tsar, in the early 19th century, when we defeated Napoleon in 1812. He was also the grandson of Catherine the Great. And so this column was uh, put up here to commemorate the victory over Napoleon. And that is um, why it is called Alexander's Column. It's believed that this angel over here has the face of Alexander I. But truly, it is really hard to tell because it's almost impossible to see the angel's face. The column is pretty tall. Uh, you would just be standing over here. The angel would be pretty far away. And the history of the column is quite remarkable. Um, kind of on the other end of downtown, you can see this cathedral with a gilded dome. Uh, this cathedral is called St. Isaac's Cathedral, and it was made by a French architect, Auguste Montferrand. Um, he basically connected his whole life with St. Petersburg because the construction of that cathedral took 40 years um, so a major part of his life was occupied by it. Um, and another thing that he did was put this column up here. Uh, and the thing about this column is that it is made of solid piece of granite and nothing holds it in its place. So it just stands on a stand and it's just gravity basically. That's it. Nothing else holds it. And um, when this column was just put here, uh, people were legitimately afraid of walking around the column because they thought it would fall any time. But uh, it never did. And just to prove that it is absolutely safe to walk around this column, um, Auguste Montferrand himself, the architect, walked his dog around the column uh, every day. And um, it has been proven to be safe for sure because it's been over 200 years and the column has been there the whole time. Um, and of course, probably one of the most famous highlights of St. Petersburg is right in front of you. Uh, the name of this building is the Winter Palace. And so that is the winter residence of our royal family. Um, the Winter Palace, because they only lived here in the winter during the cold time and they had summer palaces that are located outside of St. Petersburg. Um, another thing that the Winter Palace is famous for is being 
a part of the Hermitage Museum. The Hermitage itself occupies three different buildings. Uh, the Winter Palace is one of them. And then there are two more. This one is called the Small Hermitage. And then this one is called the New Hermitage. And all together, they make a complex of the Hermitage Museum. I do a tour of the Hermitage Museum as well. Feel free to get in touch with me if you are interested in doing that. But today I'm just going to give you a peek into the museum. And I was thinking, you know, I've been doing this tour for a while. Every time I kind of show the same interiors and I decided since so many of you are back with me today, I decided to treat you to an interior that I have not included in any of my virtual tours before. And even if you were at the Hermitage, it's really unlikely that you saw it. It's possible, but it's not really part of a usual Hermitage route. So the room that I'm about to show you is one of the private rooms of the Winter Palace. So this is where the Romanov family actually lived. Um, so just wait for it. <laughs> and I'm going to take you there. Here we are. So the room that I'm about to show you is um, called the boudoir. It is the so-called boudoir. Um, and the boudoir is located on the spot where originally Catherine the Great, the young German princess who had just moved to Russia to marry into the royal family, she occupied this area originally. And um, the way that this was all laid out at the time of Catherine the Great um, was that the, this boudoir had secret rooms uh, that uh, would take her to some even more private rooms where she would often meet her so-called favorite. Um, and you can see over here in the corner, this is a secret door to a secret room, right? You can kind of see it there. It's blends with uh, the rest of the decor, but it is here. But this is what the room of Catherine the Great could have looked like, but it was not designed this way during her rule. This decor uh, that reminds us of the 18th century was also created, it was actually created here in the middle of the 19th century for one of the wives um, of Russian emperors. Her name was Empress Maria, and her husband's name was Alexander II. So I shared with you about Alexander I. This one is Alexander II. Some of you who are the connoisseurs of Russian history and heard a lot about Alexander II, you might recall that Alexander II is the one who was assassinated right on this spot where the Church on Spilled Blood is located, right? So this gorgeous boudoir was designed for his wife. It was one of her private rooms. And after her, um, the next generations of the Romanovs used it too. So Nicholas II and his wife, um, Alexandra, and they used this interior too. So that is an amazing thing about the Hermitage Museum. It was the royal residence. So in here, you don't only see a gorgeous art collection, but you also see the rooms where, you know, Princess Anastasia or Catherine the Great or Grigory Rasputin set foot. Um, these are all original interiors. By the way, one of my favorite details in the Winter Palace are these really cool um, door handles. Look at them. It's like a bird's foot holding uh, a stone. It's really cool. Um, and they have them in several rooms. And I, whenever I see them in the, these rooms, I just love them. Interesting. Anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just a, yeah, part of the design. Um, so yeah, these interiors were designed for Empress Maria, again, um, the wife of Alexander II. Right, but we are going to go back to Nevsky Prospect. We are back over here, and we're going just to pretend to take a little walk uh, down this way. Where the next thing that I wanted to show you is um, also a palace, which might remind you of the Winter Palace because it was designed by the same 
person. <laughs> um, here it is. And I know that some of you definitely have talked uh, about this palace with me. Um, this palace is called the Stroganov Palace. And the Stroganov Palace might remind you of the word beef stroganoff, right? That is a famous Russian dish. And in fact, this is where this dish was invented. Uh, beef stroganoff was the invention of a court chef of Count Stroganoff. There are legends, several legends about why and how it was invented here. Um, one legend that really is really simple is that Count Stroganoff just had bad teeth and had a hard time chewing steaks. So his chef decided to cut the meat into smaller pieces and serve it with cream sauce. But the legend that I like more is that Count Stroganov was uh, really fond of charity and he hosted charity dinners um, in his palace. And people could come and eat, just any of people of any class could come and eat for free in the palace. And eating meat in the 18th century was a big deal. Not everybody got to eat meat all the time. Even chicken, uh, you know, was a big delicacy. And when we talk about serfs, you know, their diet mostly consisted of root vegetables and bread, um, grains. Um, and at the Palace of Count Stroganov, they believed that everybody should have a chance to eat meat. And so they ordered to, again, cook steaks for everyone. But what the court chef realized is that some people would go into the palace and they would really eat a little bit of the steaks and they ended up throwing a lot away and it made the chef mad. Uh, so what he decided to do, instead of serving full steaks to people, and then, uh, instead they would just serve meat cut into small pieces again and serve with cream sauce uh, and beef strong enough um, looks like this. I love that whenever I Google beef stroganoff in English, it comes with noodles. The pictures come with noodles because this is the American way of eating beef stroganoff. It is not the Russian way. <laughs> um, the, in Russia, I, I think I even have to make this addition to this Google search. Um, yes, in Russia, we eat our beef stroganoff with mashed potatoes um or with buckwheat uh, buckwheat is another really popular garnish in russia but i i recommend eating your beef stroganoff with mashed potatoes it is the best way so again highly recommended and you have just seen where it was invented and we are now kind of in the middle of the nevsky prospect you can see a lot of mansions that belonged to different noble families or some of these uh, buildings used to be so-called revenue houses, so places constructed specially to be basically apartments for rent. Um, 19th century apartment for rent building buildings were called revenue houses. And some really famous Russians that you have heard of, for example, I don't know, all of the Russian writers pretty much, you know, uh, Dostoevsky or Alexander Pushkin, or uh, Tchaikovsky, um, the composer, at some point in their life lived in uh, an apartment like that in a revenue house. It was really common. Speaking of Tchaikovsky, I'm going to tell you another thing that I think I've never mentioned during my tours. Um, there is a cafe right here. You can kind of see this sign um, right here. And this is a historic cafe. Uh, it's existed since the 19th century. It's called Wolf and Beranger. Um, and it's connected uh, with a lot of famous Russians. Uh, for example, Fyodor Dostoevsky um, ate there and he met uh, a revolutionary group who he later became a part of and almost got executed <laughs> as a result of that. Um, or Alexander Pushkin, you might have heard that he died on a duel and he had his last meal before his duel in this cafe. But probably the person whose life is connected the most dramatically with this cafe is Peter Tchaikovsky, the author of The Swan Lake and The Nutcracker. Uh, you might have, might have heard that he died of cholera. Um, there was a cholera epidemic in St. Petersburg. And uh, most likely uh, in this cafe, 
he got served a glass of water uh, that was contaminated with cholera and he died as a result of that. So it's a really green place. Right now, <laughs> it has been renovated and it's a nice cafe that still functions uh, as one. They call it the literature cafe. It's quite a popular place to visit. Uh, but it, 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 when it comes to uh, famous Russians, uh, this cafe has quite a grim history. And you know, so many amazing palaces here. This palace right here on this very spot, uh, there used to be a winter palace as well, uh, before the winter palace that we saw in the very beginning was constructed. You might have heard of the extravagant Empress Elizabeth. She was the daughter of Peter the Great, the founder of our city. Um, and when she was constructing the winter palace, she wanted it to be really grand. You know, it has over a thousand rooms and she had to live somewhere while it was being built. It took eight years to build. So. In this, this is where Empress Elizabeth lived uh, while the Winter Palace was being constructed. It's also the first place where Catherine the Great was staying when she came to Russia as a German princess. So another really historic corner uh, here in, on Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg. And since we are going all, down all the same street, um, we're just going to move virtually like this. We're going to uh, look at some beautiful buildings and um, you can see some beautiful public transportation that is really common for St. Petersburg. Like this is a trolley bus, for example. It's kind of a hybrid of a bus and a tram, right? It doesn't use tracks, but it uses wires as a trolley bus. And right behind the trolley bus, is a church uh, that I do mention during my Churches of St. Petersburg tour. Um, it is a Lutheran Church of St. Peter uh, because uh, this was a Lutheran neighborhood, a German uh, neighborhood to be precise. Um, and this Church of St. Peter was the center of the German life in St. Petersburg until the Russian Revolution of 1917. Uh, because you might have heard one thing that happened in our country during the Soviet regime. We were officially an atheist country and a lot of things they were converted into other things. And um, this church during the Soviet times functioned as a swimming pool. And that is why it is so remarkable. <laughs> um, as we keep walking down the street, there are a lot more gorgeous sites. Um, for example, right in front of us is the famous Kazan Cathedral. And Kazan Cathedral um, was one of the many things that were constructed in our city to commemorate the victory over Napoleon. Uh, just like the column that we saw earlier, uh, this church was built for the same reason, uh, also soon after 1812. Uh, the story of us defeating Napoleon is quite impressive because Napoleon's troops got all the way to Moscow and they even occupied Moscow. And they believed that they had captured Moscow, but it wasn't entirely true uh, because the citizens abandoned the city. There were no supplies for Napoleon's troops. And then the Moscow started burning. You know, most likely it's because a lot of the buildings in the city were still made of wood and um, the French were not used to that. <laughs> Probably there was a fire that started in the city and eventually the majority of Moscow burned. So Napoleon's troops had nothing else to do but to go back to France uh, because their supplies were running out. And this is when Russian troops came back, chased Napoleon all the way back to Saint, oh, sorry, all the way back to Paris and this is how we won this war. It was quite an impressive strategy. And so this uh, church was built to commemorate that victory. There are monuments on two sides of the church. There's one over here uh, and the other one, let me get a little closer. The other one is right here. Uh, so this is the monument to Field Marshal Kutuzov. He was the main field marshal of the war with Napoleon. And he's buried inside this church. And on the other side is another gorgeous building. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, I'm <laughs> it's OK, David, no problem. Yeah, so this building here um, was originally built to be a singer sewing machine store. 
Uh, it's called the Singer Building. And uh, in the Singer Building, um, I, I love show, to show the little details of this building because it was constructed to be really sewing themed. So for example, this dome right here um, was supposed to look like a symbol. And there are statues uh, on two sides. And I know it's not 100% easy to see, but just look over here and you will see that the statue is holding a sewing machine under its arm. <laughs> and so does this one. Yes, uh, so it's really sewing machine themed. Um, and it was built to sell those sewing machines. But again, in 1917, we had a revolution and businesses had to leave um and so they you know singer left and this became the main bookstore of our city called the house of books um and i love i all i love uh, i always recommend going to the second floor and you might be able to see that there is a cafe here there are tables over here uh sit by the window order some good tea or coffee they have wonderful crepes there um, and just uh, you know you will have an amazing view of this cathedral right here um, so it's definitely worth going to and you can grab any book oops you can grab any book uh, from the store and uh, read it oops <laughs> you can grab any book from the store and uh, read it um, in the cafe which is awesome but we're going to keep going further down on Nevsky Prospect. And uh, the next uh, place uh, where I want to take you is in the middle of the street here. You might recognize, you can see the dome of the House of Books all the way down there. We moved a little bit further. This is the place where street artists can draw you a portrait um and uh this park is a really popular place to hang out um it's called catherine's garden uh and that uh garden was originally constructed to commemorate the um empress catherine the great uh, you can see her monument in the middle here and right behind her monument uh you can see a yellow building with white details that is a theater known as alexander's theater so that would be Alexander I again, the defeater of Napoleon. Uh, the theater was called in his honor. And Catherine the Great, she was his grandmother. So they are connected. And um, I want to just give you a better view of that monument. I have some pictures closer up, just so that you can see who are all these other people in the bottom. And the thing is, all these other people in the bottom are the so-called favorites of Catherine the Great. So uh, yeah. you might, yeah, 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 uh, lovers, but when it comes to the royals, we call them favorites. We don't call them lovers <laughs> uh, or mistresses or misters. We just call them favorites. And uh, Catherine the Great, uh, she got her first favorites really early in her career as the Russian Empress. Um, basically, uh, it started with the palace coup uh, that was conducted to put Catherine the Great on the throne. Um, and um, one of Catherine the Great's greatest loves <laughs> helped her get the throne. Um, he um, helped arrest her husband, Peter III, who was the emperor at that time. And most likely he helped kill him too uh, when he was in prison. And here is the figure of this man. Uh, his name is Count Orlov. So here he is. And uh, these other people also are uh, part of Catherine the Great's close circle. Um, they are not just her favorites. They are also people who play the significant role in Russian history. Because um, when Catherine the Great spotted talents in those people. She did not hesitate to promote them, help them get their career forward. And Counter Love helped her with internal affairs, for example. Um, you might have heard of another um, 
man who most likely Catherine the Great also secretly married afterwards. His last name was Potemkin, right? You might have heard of Battleship Potemkin, right? So that was called in his honor. And he helped her with international affairs, helped her uh, get Russia access to the Black Sea because we had wars with Turkey. Anyway, not only are those the favorites, the lovers of Catherine the Great, they are also really significant men in Russian history. And uh, right across from this garden, uh, we can see another beautiful building over here, right here. Um, and just like the Singer building, this is a store as well. Uh, and also it was built specially to be a store. But it wasn't a sewing machine store or bookstore. This was a grocery store. Uh, the name of this grocery store is the Yelisev Brothers store. And the Yelisev Brothers, they were merchant brothers. And they came from a long dynasty of merchants. They were quite a wealthy family. And uh, they actually made their fortune selling salt. Salt was really valuable in the 18th and 19th century and even early 20th century. Not only did it make food more flavor, flavorful, but it was a way of preserving food before fridges became common. So everybody needed salt. So they did make a fortune selling salt. And in the early 20th century, uh, this gorgeous store was built um, here. And now the building in front of you is kind of the main building of the store right here, but the actual store actually extended all the way here. So where right now you see the United Colors of Benetton, um, this was the fish department um, of the store. And there are legends that there was a giant fish tank or rather a swimming pool, <laughs> you would call it, uh, where they had just lots of live fish, basically the length of um, this United Colors of Benetton. Uh, and now just this uh, left side uh, functions as a store. It was always just the most luxurious grocery store in St. Petersburg and therefore in the Russian Empire. Uh, another legend uh, says that um, at the entrance of the store, there were originally two big barrels, one with black caviar and the other one with red caviar. And everybody who wanted to, they could just scoop caviar from the barrels. That's how wealthy <laughs> the Yeliseev brothers were. And even after the Russian Revolution, this place remained uh, a grocery store. I have another historic photo uh, for you um, of what the interior of the store looked like in the Soviet times. Um, so in the Soviet times, this was the place where um, the elite of the Communist Party would get their groceries. One thing uh, that you might have heard about the Soviet Union is that there was shortage of different goods, especially food often. And so people got their food with ration cards. Um, of course, those who were higher ranking people in the Soviet structure, um, they got to have better foods. They had nicer ration cards and those people would get their groceries uh, here at the Yelisev store. And now that we have seen what it looked like uh, during the Soviet times, I want to show you what it looks like right now, because it still does function as um, a grocery store. The view that we saw is this angle right here. But the thing that probably catches everyone's eye right now is that giant pineapple in the middle of the store. And um, around the pineapple, you can see tables. So this is a cafe um, where I actually highly recommend stopping, at least for a cup of coffee. So you can just relax and enjoy the city atmosphere. If you are actually walking down Nevsky Prospect by this point, you might be already pretty tired and you would like to take a break. But also this is a great place to have lunch. Um, they have lunch deals for like $10, $15. You can have a three course meal, <laughs> uh, which is really good quality. So I highly recommend uh, stopping here for lunch and it's quick as well. So this is really nice. And of course you can also buy groceries in here. It is pretty expensive, but they have really nice 
cheeses, uh, cured meats, and of course, amazing desserts. Uh, right in front of you is just their part of their dessert section. <laughs> um, also, you might notice over here, uh, these are wax figures of the Yelisev brothers, the founders of the store, and they actually move. Uh, they, if you, when you come to the store, you might notice them waving at you. <laughs> uh, so here is the Yelisev brothers store for you. We are right in the middle of uh, Nevsky Prospect. Um, and as we move forward uh, down the street, um, you can see some more beautiful sites. This palace, for example, also was part of the palaces of palace system of the royal family. Uh, for example, uh, this palace uh, was occupied by young Nicholas II <laughs> before he was the Russian ruler. It was historically occupied by the young princes, the young Romanov princes. Right now, uh, this building functions as um, a center, like a extracurricular activity center for kids. So kids can come there in the afternoon and learn anything from um, chess to riding the motorcycle. There are many different things that you can learn there. And, um, if we move just a little bit further down the street, uh, we will actually see another canal. Um, St. Petersburg is a city of rivers and canals. Uh, Nevsky Prospect is crossed by uh, many rivers and canals. And one thing that I recommend doing is taking a boat ride uh, in St. Petersburg. And you can join one of those anywhere. <laughs> uh, anywhere where Nevsky Prospect is crossed by canals or rivers, so it will be really easy to find. Um, but the best boat ride uh, that I recommend taking um, starts approximately from over here. It, the pier is located right outside uh, the building that I want to show you next. And uh, that building is called the Fabergé Museum. Uh, you might have heard of that museum before. Um, it is quite new, so um, it only appeared within the last 10 years. And uh, it is on that river and that crosses Nevsky Prospect over there. The pier is right outside, uh, so I highly recommend taking a boat from here. Um, and here is the building itself. It is also a palace, what a surprise. <laughs> uh, but this palace belonged not to our royal family, but to a wealthy aristocratic family whose last name were the Shuvalovs. And uh, as happened to many palaces during the Soviet times, it was converted into something else. This in fact was converted into like a, um, building like a concert hall slash reception building. Uh, many different events took place here. But what's remarkable about it is what happened to it really recently. And I'm going to tell you that in just a second. We have a question in the chat. Um, all right, <laughs> Jalil, uh, thank you for joining us today. So what happened to this building recently? Um, recently, um, it was converted into museum known as the Fabergé Museum. But really the museum and the building are owned by this charity fund um, called the Link of Times. And the main purpose of that fund is to um, bring back historic values to Russia, restore things that are lost. And the, the collection of the Fabergé eggs is the highlight uh, of their museum. Because as you might know, Fabergé eggs they were um, pieces created specially for the royal family. And right after the Russian Revolution of 1917, a lot of these pieces were smuggled abroad. Uh, some of them ended up in France, some in Germany, and a big chunk of them ended up in the US, in the Forbes collection. Uh, Malcolm Forbes owned um, more than 10 Fabergé eggs. But at some point, the Forbes family decided to sell their collection. And this is when the, this fund, the Link of Times, came into play. They purchased the whole collection from the Forbes family, and they started this museum in this building, which they also restored. It was in really bad shape, and they restored it. And today, I want to show you that room with Fabergé eggs 
um, show you some of the highlights uh, of our Fabergé egg collection. Um, my favorite egg is right in front of you. It is called the wedding egg, also known as lily of the valley egg. Uh, and it was created as a gift for the wife of our last emperor. Uh, basically, this was the idea behind all of the eggs. So Karl Fabergé, he was a court jeweler of our last emperor. Um, and every year he created these beautiful eggs for our last emperor, especially to give one to his wife and the other one to his mother. And every year he connected the design of the eggs with something that had happened to them that year. So for example, this egg is the wedding egg. And it was designed to be, um, uh, it was designed because they got married that year. And really it is designed with the Empress's most favorite things. For example, Lily of the Valley uh, was her favorite flower. And we can see uh, it's decorated with beautiful Lily of the Valley flower made of pearls. And then you can see this pink enamel. And this exact shade of pink was the Empress's favorite color. Uh, they called it salmon color. Uh, so uh, another thing about all of these eggs is that they all had a little surprise inside. And the surprise of this egg is a little picture frame. You can see it right now sticking out of the egg, but it, it was possible to push down. Right now it has the pictures of Nicholas and two of their oldest kids. Uh, of course, those pictures were added later as the girls were born. Um, another beautiful egg um, is located right here. And this egg um, is known as the coronation egg. Um, naturally, it was created in the year that Nicholas was crowned. And the design of this egg uh, reminds us of um, the cloak that he wore uh, during the coronation. It's also decorated with precious stones and diamonds and enamel. The golden color, the yellow color is all enamel. The surprise of this egg was this carriage that you can see next to it. And this carriage is just amazing. It is an exact copy of the carriage that Russian emperors would use during their coronation. And Nicholas himself noted that every detail of this carriage, even the steps that would you know, come out as you would climb the carriage, you know, to every minute detail was exactly the same as the original carriage. Another remarkable egg is located uh, in the other end of the room. Here it is. Let me give you a good view. So right in front of you now is the first Fabergé egg, um, the very first egg that was created for the royal family. And the design of this egg is just so different um, uh, than the rest of them. Uh, it is called the hen egg. And basically, as you can see, it was designed especially to look like a real egg. Uh, the outside uh, was decorated with enamel to look like the egg shell. And the inside that was supposed to be the egg yolk was made of gold. And inside the yolk, there was also this little chicken right here. So it was one thing altogether. Um, this is actually what brought Karl Fabergé to Russia and uh, made him the royal family's court jeweler. Um, there was an exhibition in Paris um, where Fabergé presented an egg like that. And the empress just really liked this egg so much um, and they commissioned another one from Karl Fabergé. And this is how he became uh, the court jeweler of the royal family. What a, what a great connection, right? And, but this room is not the only um, not the only highlight of the museum. There are a lot of beautiful rooms that they restored. Um, for example, 
this room is dedicated to silver, the silver collection of the Fabergé company. So they didn't just make X, they made a lot of things. And for example, here you can see beautiful ceremonial silver dishes, right? Or another interior uh, that I wanted to show you is this beautiful interior, which is the main staircase of the mansion, which also was in bad shape. And the spans, the link of times, they restored the staircase completely as well. So this museum is really worth visiting. I highly recommend doing that. It doesn't take a lot of time. If you just want to see the Fabergé eggs, it will take you maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but you can spend over an hour here looking at all the different rooms. It's definitely worth it. And then afterwards, you can take a boat ride to relax. So this works out perfectly. Uh, we are kind of moving towards the end of Nevsky Prospect now. Um, we have seen a lot of the highlights of the street. Um, and uh, the next thing that I want to show you is on the other end of the street. We started with the beginning was the Winter Palace and the main square of our city. This is another really important square of St. Petersburg that is on the other end of Nevsky Prospect. And if the first square that we saw is connected with our royal family, right? It's the palace square. It's has their palace where they lived. The other end is connected with the opposite thing. This square is called the uprising square. And it is connected with the history of Russian Revolution. So during the revolution of 1917, some of the biggest riots or uprisings, right, um, took place in this very spot. And that's what gave it its name. And really a lot of things here uh, come from different historic times, which is amazing. Uh, for example, this is a hotel uh, that was constructed here in the early 20th century. Um, we also have an example of the 19th century architecture over here. Uh, this is a train station known as the Moscow train station. And if you do want to go to Moscow from St. Petersburg, I highly recommend leaving from here. Uh, from this train station, you can, uh, you can take the high speed train to Moscow and the way to Moscow will take you only four hours, unlike um, regular train, which would take you um, overnight. Normally, that's an overnight train. So from here, you can take a high-speed train. And finally, uh, in the very center of the square, you can see this obelisk. And this obelisk is dedicated to our city during World War II. And uh, I have to mention that when World War II was happening and really throughout the majority of the Soviet time, uh, our city was not St. Petersburg, it was called Leningrad. Um, and after World War II, Leningrad was uh, given the status of a hero city. And every city in the Soviet Union that was considered a hero city um, got a star. Um, a star award. And so you can see this star award right here because um, the things that happened in Leningrad during World War II were truly fascinating and the citizens of Leningrad were true heroes. Um, so there was a siege of Leningrad. Our city was surrounded by the Nazis for 900 days. Um, the first thing that they bombed was the food storage and people in the city were left almost without food for the whole duration of the siege. It was really hard. Um, the worst days of the siege, the daily portion of bread was 125 grams, so a really small amount. It's like a size of a Snickers bar of bread per day. And these people had to work. These people had to go through really cold and dark winters. But the city survived and uh, was given the status of a hero city because uh, the siege was broken. So Hitler's troops Troops um, never got to go get into the city. Another thing that is important about the uprising square is this building right here. And uh, it looks like a Greek temple, <laughs> but it's not, it's not a temple of any kind. This building is a metro station. 
uh, the uh, above ground part, the entrance to the metro station. Um, and the name of this metro station is the Uprising Square. Um, this is a great example of a station that was part of the first metro line in Leningrad uh, that was put together in 1950s. So the first line was called the red line, you know, red color was really important for the Soviet culture. And it connected the city center with the outskirts. Uh, I show the other end during my Soviet free tour. Uh, so those of you who have seen that tour remember what's on the other end of the line. And um, the stations of the red line are especially beautiful. They were designed with a lot of care and they were designed especially to raise the spirits of the citizens of Leningrad. Um, life was tough <laughs> in the Soviet times. We already talked about the fact that there was a shortage of goods often, you know, lines for food, um, uh, clothes, really to buy anything. Living conditions were also not the easiest. Oftentimes people had to share their apartments with other families. Um, and there had to be some places that were parts of people's everyday life that were beautiful that raised the spirits of the people and made them believe that um, the Soviet Union is a powerful country and the metro system and the metro stations were a part of this whole ideology, Soviet ideology. Uh, I don't have the 360 view of what the station looks like inside, but I do have some photos. Um, so I'm going to show you these photos here. Um, so, for example, here is one of them. Uh, this is what the inside of the station looks like. And when I bring my guests to the metro anywhere in Russia, uh, the first thing that I hear is, wow, it is so clean. <laughs> it's so beautiful and so clean. Our metro truly is really clean. Um, we take really good care of it. People don't, normally don't throw trash there. And every night when the metro is closed, um, they thoroughly clean all the stations and all of the train cars. Uh, but it wasn't, it's not just about the fact that it's clean, it's also about its design. Um, and this design uh, is in this architectural style that people call Stalin's Baroque. Um, so it's, it combines the elements of the Soviet emblematics, right? Uh, hammer, hammer and sickles or stars. And these like palace-like or temple-like elements. Um, and it's supposed to show the greatness of the Soviet Union, almost as if we were ancient Greece or ancient Rome, right? Or um, Baroque era uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, you can see beautiful lamps, laurel uh, leaves, but also in the walls, uh, there are these bar reliefs um, that depict uh, scenes from the history of the Russian Revolution. Um, so, for example, this one over here uh, is a scene with our own Vladimir Lenin over here, standing on top of a tank and making a speech. Uh, it's a really famous revolution scene that all the Russians know. Um, when he just came back from Finland, where he spent some time in hiding, um, he made a famous speech while standing on top of a tank. <laughs> and this is what is depicted here. So the idea was that people would, um, while they're using the metro system in their everyday lives, would really be reminded of how great the Soviet Union was. And, um, see kind of what it is all for because everyday life was hard people were suffering but people believed that they were building communism people believed that even though it was hard for them then the next generations would live a happy uh thriving life and that was part of the part of the reason why those metro stations were designed so beautifully and uh, you can you can see a close-up of this bar relief and i just want to go back into the station so you can see kind of like where in the station um, they are located. Um, and to this day, I'm really proud of the metro in both St. Petersburg and Moscow. 
um, it's really efficient. And yes, people in Russia do own cars, but it is really easy to get around by metro. If you plan to come to Russia, I highly recommend, you know, use the metro. It's not only is it beautiful, but it is really efficient. Everything is translated into English. Um, there are stations everywhere. The trains come to the stations every three minutes in St. Petersburg. So you don't have to look up the schedule anywhere. Just come into the metro, wait three minutes and the train will be there. It's really cheap. The cost of a ride in St. Petersburg is just a dollar and it doesn't matter how far you go. At this point, it's even less than a dollar actually. The, the rates uh, keep changing, but uh, it doesn't matter how far you go, how long you stay inside the metro, the cost is always the same. So I do recommend that you use the, the metro as your means of transport when you visit St. Petersburg. And let's just, before we finish, let's have an overview of the street that we saw, right? We started with this city overview and I would just want to circle back to the street that uh, we took with you today. We started in the beginning, had a little peek inside the Winter Palace, went further down. This is the place, the Stroganov Palace, where we talked about Russia's famous beef Stroganov. This is the Lutheran church where the swimming pool was located. Um, the House of Books um, was the famous big tower. Um, and then we just went further down. Uh, this is the grocery store that we saw. And all the way down here is the Uprising Square. So we made um, quite a big trip so the highlights of the main street of St. Petersburg, by the way, the Fabergé Museum uh, is, is another thing that we saw and that is located uh, over here. <laughs> um, and uh, I would love to answer any questions. Does anybody have any questions or would like to share anything? I, I would love to answer or hear your comments. Thank you, that was pretty good. <clears throat> Thank you, David. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, I love that you guys keep coming to my tours. Uh, I guess it means you keep learning something new every time, which is awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, my time in St. Petersburg wasn't very long. A lot of those buildings we got to walk past, but never got to go in. Mm -hmm. It's on my bucket list to go back and just spend time and yeah. go in as many as I can. But, but yeah. That's kind of cool, that aerial view. I could see where we used to live, too. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Definitely, um, definitely worth staying close to the Nevsky Prospect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is all those, are all those buildings open today is a question that I have. Yes. So all the buildings that I showed you, they are open. Even now, during the pandemic, our museums have reopened already. Uh, they do let in a limited amount of people but still um, a fair amount <laughs> it's possible to visit those museums so you can go inside the hermitage and the hermitage for those of you who obviously are not in st petersburg right now they have a great youtube channel um the hermitage and while the majority of their videos are in russian they do have some in english um, so just search for the hermitage on youtube and you'll be able to find some of their uh, great, you know, inside uh, videos. Oh, I have another question. Um, oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Brent. Um, yes, you have to wear a mask. If you do come into those museums, you would have to wear a mask. In Russia, we oh, same to the US, we have the mask regime everywhere. They reopened even the malls now, but you still have to wear a mask everywhere. <laughs> Um, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, this is a free tour, but if you guys want to leave a donation or a tip, this is my PayPal page. You're more than welcome to leave your donations here, whichever you're comfortable with, $5, $10. Um, I'm going to copy and paste this link into the chat, so you guys are welcome to use it and uh, for those of you who are new um, and would like to stay in touch and 
learn about the other tours that we do. I want to show our Facebook page where we post the information about our tours. Here it is, Eagle Travel Tours to Russia. And today was one of those free Thursday tours. Um, but we do have them every Thursday. You're welcome to um, join us every Thursday, at least until the end of August, I'm going to have these tours. And then if you prefer to use something other than Facebook, you can also subscribe. Oops, <laughs> um, I, I need to load it, but uh, you can subscribe to our email newsletter. Um, I need to open that page. Um, so this email newsletter, um, if you subscribe, it will uh, give you, immediately send you the recording of the last free tour that I did. Here it is. Um, it will send you the recording of the last free tour that I did, which was Churches of St. Petersburg. Um, all you need to do is to put your email address here and click subscribe, and it will immediately send you the recording. And then every Monday, it will send you information about all of the content that came out, um, like YouTube videos, for example. My latest YouTube video is about a three-day itinerary in St. Petersburg, so what to do if you stay in St. Petersburg for three days. Um, and yeah, uh, and all the, it will have the information about um, the upcoming tours. So I am posting this link into the chat. If you want to subscribe to our email newsletter, you're welcome to do that. So subscribe to our newslet uh, newsletter, feel free to use PayPal, paypal.me slash Olga Russia. And um, I hope to see you guys again in my future tours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thank rest you. of your Thanks, week. Olga. Thanks, Paula. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, sure. Evelyn. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.